Welcome back. We are in module 1, which is an introductory part of the lecture of this course on bilingualism. So, in module uh, 1 part 1 and module 1 part 2, we have set the background of the course. Background as in, uh, in module 1 we have seen how uh, bilingual societies are created, uh, typically they are arising out of language contact scenario and we also saw how different kinds of language contact can give rise to different types of um, outcome. Bilingualism is one of that and even within that bilingualism is part of a continuum. So, there are many other possibilities that might happen after the society has become bilingual. Okay? And then second uh, module also we carried on the narrative and as to how what are the hallmarks of a bilingual society what are certain identifiers and how they work out in different uh, combinations with different societies uh, with respect to language policies and so on. So, today we will move on to the individual. So, from the society to the individual bilingual person that is what is the focus of uh, this part of the uh, first module. So, who is a bilingual that is what we will see. Is it enough to say that a person speaks two languages so hence he is a bilingual? Just as we saw that bilingual society is not a homogeneous thing, societies can be bilingual uh, given uh, different kinds of background. So, either it is a, a bilingualism is fostered due to trade situation, bilingualism can also be a result of immigration, bilingualism can also be a result of colonialism and so on. Now, each of these historical events will have slight uh, different shade of bilingualism in the society. So, there are various um, different there are nuances even within social bilingual. So, similarly, even a bilingual person just because he is a by he speaks two language does a, not every bilingual is a same person. So, that is what we will see. So, we will basically try to uh, parse the different aspects of a bilingual individual. So, first the basics, who is a bilingual? A very uh, basic question if you ask the answer will be a person who speaks and understands of course, two languages. Now, uh, this is um, another term for the same is polyglot which was uh, used which is still used uh, in non-technical domains. So, a polyglot is somebody who knows more than one language. So, polyglots were uh, highly respected at one point of time. We they, uh, remember we talked about some people might become bilingual uh, due to their personal interests. Some uh, scholars have been bilingual quite often in the historical uh, in history. So, polyglots. Some people sometimes may be specially talented. You must have seen all of you must be aware of somebody who picks up languages very easily. So, X speaks two or three languages, uh, you know he just picked it up, he wherever he goes he learns the local language and thereby he becomes a polyglot. That is a kind of an exception, people like that are an exception. More often than not if somebody is a bilingual chances are very high that he or she belongs to a bilingual society. So, social bilingualism entails individual bilingualism, the opposite may not be true. This is something we have seen before as well. So, another important thing for uh, a bilingual society or for a person to be bilingual is uh, again more often than not there are also of course, always exceptions, but there, um, uh, the bilingual person belongs to the minority community, minority as in in the social hierarchy the bilingual in all probability will belong to the weaker section. So, weaker does not necessarily mean uh, weaker in terms of numbers that is also possible. So, uh, when we say a person is bilingual chances are that he belongs to either one of these one he is part of a sort of community which is numerically smaller and thereby it is dominated by a numerically stronger community that is one. Secondly, the second language is the language of opportunity that might be the language of education that might be the language of um, jobs that might be the language for any other uh, opportunity for social mobility. So, these are possibilities various possibilities. So, typically this is uh, often the case. Remember the uh, members of the stronger language uh, community need not learn the weaker language. So, Hindi English bilingual is very common, but English Hindi bilingual will be a case where somebody has taken an active interest in Hindi language not because the social um, the dynamics demand it that is the point. Okay? So, somebody is a bilingual almost all the cases it will be he belongs to the uh, weaker section socially, politically, economically, numerically maybe any or all of them together that is uh, often the case. 
sometimes the weaker language may not uh, whatever the L1 is that is the first language is may not be weaker in the sense that they lack political power or they lack uh, financial power or they, they do not have the numbers. It is simply because in a particular context this is still the language is less powerful in terms of opportunities. So, let us say Hindi English bilinguals, Hindi language ha has a very large number of speakers, it is also the language of culture, it is also the language of music and so many other things. So, it is not really weak in that sense. However, compared to English it often uh, appears weaker. So, in that case it will be considered uh, Hindi um, will be considered with respect to English, but Hindi will not be weaker in terms of let us say Bhojpuri. When you compare Hindi and Bhojpuri, Bhojpuri will be considered a weaker uh, language. So, that is how basically. So, ultimately it, it comes down to the context. Okay. So, these are some more examples uh, of the same dynamics. So, Dimasa speaker in Assamese, Dimasa are a smaller group compared to the dominant Assamese group. So, Dimasa uh, speakers for all Dimasa speakers Assamese language is mandatory. They need to learn Assamese because Assamese is the language of education, job, this is the state official language. So, in any state the state official language is the most dominant language, all other languages will be comparatively weaker. So, that is what is happening even in Assam and for that matter any other state. right? So, for all other purposes if you can club them together as language of social mobility all Dimasa speakers will need to learn Assamese. People in the rural Dimasa areas if they do not speak Assamese the opportunities will not come to them that is the situation. So, Assamese Dimasa situation if you take Assamese is dominant Dimasa is weaker. Now, you take the same Assamese language and compare it with English language and then the dynamics changes change again. So, if you are looking for opportunities bigger opportunities for uh, yourself in terms of financial security or whatever it may be all kinds of upward social mobility outside of the state of Assam or even within the state of Assam English is the language English is the source through which you have to uh, go there. So, just change the context and change the scenario and you get a different uh, dynamic pattern there. So, basically ultimately it is about context context of language use. Now, this is how we would normal people lay people will talk about bilingualism that is understandable. But when it, when it comes to experts the idea is typically explained in terms of competence, competence as in how well you know a particular language. Now, as in all other fields even here there has been lot of disagreements among scholars as to what constitutes competence. Now, language has four different aspects speaking, hearing, reading and writing. Now, reading writing are uh, in terms of history in, in chronologically speaking they have come into existence much later than speaking and hearing. However, in, in the literature you will find if you go back a little bit you will see many scholars are giving that to be considered a fully functional bilingual the person should have competence in all these four aspects of language uh, knowledge of language. So, speaking uh, understanding reading and writing. Over a period of time of course, things have changed a bit and now we more or less there is an agreement that uh, the two domains of speaking and hearing are uh, good enough, you, uh, reading and writing would be an added qualification. So, that brings us to that bilinguals should have native like competence in both languages. This is something that has been believed for a very long time. Uh, for somebody to be con considered a bilingual his second language competence should be like L1 speaker of the same language. So, what does that mean? That means, for me to consider myself an Assamese in English bilingual my English should be as good as that of a native speaker of English language that is how the stand was. There has also been another stand here which says that someone who has a minimal competence of a second language, minimal competence as in you may not be able to read the highbrow literature in the second language or you may not be able to deliver an academic uh, lecture in the second language. However, if you can go around in a new city using your second language uh, knowledge that is also uh, enough. So, you may not be able to carry out a lengthy uh, conversation with a local person in the language, but if you can manage your on full day going about a in a new city using your second language that is also fine that is another. And of course, competence in all the four language dimensions which I just mentioned. So, these are some areas that uh, different scholars have um, put more emphasis on across time. 
Now when we say knowledge of language in terms of the systems within a language there are few things that are part and parcel of the structure of the language which is phonology, morphology and syntax. So, phonology refers to the sound system of a language, morphology the word processing, word generation process and syntax is the sentence structure. Now, for any person to know a language you must know at least all of these three. So, the sound system you must uh, master, you also should know how words are formed and how they you know what are the permutations, combinations possible, how to create sentences like declarative from declarative to interrogative and so on. So, that, that, that is at the core of a language, uh, your knowledge of language. Now, any native speaker of any language has very high competence on all these three systems of his or her uh, L1 first language. So, a native speaker of Hindi will know very well. In fact, knowledge here does not really mean um, externally created knowledge system. This is something you grow up with. So, you know the how the sound structure of your language is, you know what the how the words are formed and how even if you are not conscious about it, you are not really all the time aware ok, I am creating the word like this. So, the sleep and then sleeping the, that becomes a continuous tense not like that, but native speakers simply know because they have acquired that language from birth. So, that is how it is. So, native speakers have very high and almost uh, all more often than not equal competence in all these three domains. How are they different from the second language speaker of the same language? Second language speakers uh, that is L2 speakers may not have equal level of competence in all these three domains. So, a person might have better, better grip on the morphology of his second language, but not on the syntax of the second language. That, that is quite possible and that happens quite often. However, he or she may have a uh, manageable level of competence in order to be able to speak simple sentences. One area which typically stands out when a second language speaker is concerned is the pronunciation which is where the phonological aspect comes in. So, the sound structure well, which is something uh, you will automatically know immediately know if uh, a person is a native speaker of uh, Assamese or somebody who is speaking Assamese as a second language because the sound structure you do not sound like a native speaker. Native speakers will catch you immediately because the subtle very subtle nuances often is very difficult to master. Another case where the differences are quite clear is the vocabulary size. So, L2 speakers may not have the equal amount of vocabulary in his or L2 as the L1 speaker of the same language which is typically the case. So, my uh, vocabulary in English language will not be as rich as that of a native speaker of English language. So, that is what we mean by. So, there are these are the two uh, most important areas where the differences are very clearly visible. One is the sound system, other is the that is the accent what is, what is popularly called accent and then there is this vocabulary size. These are the two uh, important things. Now, there are interesting uh, stories about this that uh, why do we not acquire the why do we not sound like native speakers or is it uh, totally impossible. It seems that it is not really impossible to sound like native speakers you know to, to master the uh, phonological aspects of the new language it is not entirely impossible. The, this has been found out with people who migrate into a new community and they have spent enough number of years in the host culture they may ultimately finally uh, end up speaking like nat native speakers that is also possible. However, some authors have pointed out some uh, very interesting angle to it which is sometimes speakers do not knowingly they do not uh, yeah, use the native speakers accent they may they maintain their own L1 accent because it sometimes may uh, give you some added benefit right. So, one is uh, the French accent which we mentioned in the in the previous uh, parts that French accented English in America is considered somewhat um, sophisticated and you know exotic and so on uh, which is not the case with Asian accent for example. Similarly, there is a, a very uh, interesting joke about Henry Kissinger who uh, all of you might be already uh, familiar with. He was a very uh, very powerful advisor to the American presidents and so on, heavy, very uh, well learned man and very sophisticated man of letters and so on. Now, he migrated to his family migrated to US when he was uh, 
about 12, 13 years of age. So, he had enough uh, number of years in the US to have mastered and in fact, he spoke perfectly fine American English in many cases. But in some cases, he had uh, he used his heavily uh, heavy German accented English language uh, and he himself says that maybe because I am I was too conscious in the initial years, so my accent did not go. But some others jokingly say that uh, uh, Henry Kissinger wanted to sound like a German because it sounds like a, a very profound European professor. So, language being a human and social uh, thing, it has its nuances and it has its uh, humors as well. So, anyway, so these are the some uh, subtle aspects of what we call um, competence in terms of language. Now, when we talk about competence, there are primarily two aspects. One of which we have already seen the grammatical aspect meaning you need to know the morphology, you need to know the syntax, you know, need to know the sound system that is one aspect of uh, competence. Another important aspect of competence is what we call communicative competence. Communicative competence is equally important as far as language is concerned because that is what helps you function in the L2 society because languages have their norms. Knowing the grammar is not enough, you should know what to speak, when and how and to whom that is very crucial. So, this basically takes you to the speaker's social meaning. I might utter a sentence which, uh, which may have an implication which is also something that you need to understand. So, if I a sentence like I guess the cook forgot to add salt to my soup does not necessarily mean that you have to agree yes or no. Probably my intention is to ask you politely to pass the salt um, uh, to me. So that is that this, this kind of simple things as this, this knowledge is part of the communicative competence. A good example in Hindi would be the use of pronouns. So what kind of pronouns to be used with whom? Hindi language has very strict uh, rules. Mo most Indian languages have very strict rules. In parts of Uttar Pradesh for example, the AAP pronoun is used for children which is not always the case in other parts of the country. Now, just knowing Hindi through grammar or having grammatical competence in Hindi, this will not be told to you. This is very difficult to learn. So, this is something you learn through uh, your interaction in the society and thereby developing your uh, communicative competence, right. Now, there are many other ways of looking at bilinguals, there are many other uh, levels of differences within the bilingual society that has been uh, put forward. One of them is of course, the individual versus the social. So, individual uh, if we go by uh, definition, what is individual bilingualism? It is a psychological state of an individual who has access to two different uh, codes to serve uh, communicative purposes. Languages are ultimately a codified system of communication. So, you code your concepts into words and that is how it works. So, this is a psychological state of being. On the other hand, societal bilingualism or social bilingualism both the terms are used, uh, two bilingual languages are used in a community side by side. Okay. So, society by and large could be bilingual. So, more for many purposes uh, in the society formal, informal, many other purposes both languages can be used. So, languages live side by side that is societal bilingualism that is one um, kind of division that has been uh, historically given. So, another way of differentiating among bilinguals is the idea as to whether a bilingual is a uh, this is called fractional versus the holistic view. The fractional view is also called monolingual view of bilingualism, holistic is called the bilingual view of bilingualism. So, basic idea is the fractional view, this basically takes the position that a bilingual is equivalent to two monolinguals put together. So, if I say I am an Assamese Hindi bilingual, so I am Assamese person and an Hindi person put together that is the idea of fractional bilingualism. Okay, so, this basically entails equal uh, parallel linguistic competence. So, that leading to parallel linguistic processing. So, when I am processing as in when I am either speaking or comprehending one language, the other language is not affected. So, there is no contribution or there is no give and take between the two languages that is what is basically the entailment of this. So, this basically means that the bilingual has two separate and isolable co components, also isolable types of competency in terms of his or her 
two languages that is what uh, this theory entails. The reason why this view was very dominant for quite a long time is that language studies started with monolinguals studies on language, studies on language structure, usage or whatever different kinds of uh, studies we are involving language has always taken the monolingual as the normal subject, as the normal population to study. And from there bilingual studies and bilingualism or all of that uh, emerged. So, as a result monolingualism and the monolingual subject dominated. And this is what gave rise to. So, from a monolingual you go to a, to go and become a bilingual. So, basically you are creating some sort of a split personality uh, kind of thing in terms of language. So, there are different languages and you, you have all fractions you are broken into two three pieces and each of them remains separate right. So, as a result monolingual speech and language has been used as a yardstick. So, when you take monolinguals as the starting point, when you take monolinguals as the normal population and bilinguals as some kind of a of an exception, then your yardsticks of judgment also will be from monolingual perspective. So, if monolingual have a vocabulary size of this much, then how does a bilingual fare as compared to it? If a monolingual does this uh, kind of judgment on morphological processes, how will the bilingual? So, basically the point of departure for our fractional view of bilingual has always been a monolingual person ok. So, another reason that some people have put forward of uh, fractional view of bilingualism uh, remaining dominant for some time is that writing systems are always monolingual. We might be bilingual in our speech right, but writing systems typically are monolinguals. You cannot uh, you do not nobody really mixes two different scripts and writes. It's, it's very unusual, it's quite unusual. So, writing systems are typically monolingual. Hence, all of these together given the historical uh, perspective as well as these factors uh, are responsible for the fractional view of bilingualism. Now, this has serious consequences uh, in terms of research, in terms of how we look at bilinguals and so on. So, bilinguals first and foremost bilinguals have been described in terms of fluency and balance in their two languages. Just as we say we said in the beginning that a bilingual is like a native speaker of the language. So, you are as fluent as the uh, monolingual in your L2, a monolingual in L2 would be a uh, bilingual must be fluent in the accordingly uh, in, in that language similarly. Language skills of a bilingual is also apprised in terms of monolingual standards. So, in terms of vocabulary, in terms of knowledge of phonology, morphology, syntax, in terms of communicative competence, all of for all of these the gold standard is the monolingual of that language. And now keeping that as a uh, as ear stick you compare the bilinguals performance on all of these. So, that is how it has been. So, contact between bilinguals two languages is seen as accidental as I said all of these are considered uh, accidental or exceptional, they are not the norm, they are just the exceptions. So, again the research also on bilingualism is conducted in terms of the bilinguals individual languages, how, how a bilingual uh, does in his L1 versus his L2, what are the um, you know various kinds of cues are used. So, how is the response in terms of cue to L1 versus the same cue on L2 like this, it is always dividing the languages uh, as if treating the bilingual as a monolingual in different states uh, of uh, mental states. This also has another we would say unexpected result from the bilinguals themselves. It, it has been found out that uh, bilinguals themselves rarely view them, themselves as equally competent in both languages. So, uh, bilinguals themselves think that uh, okay, my L2 is not as good as my L1 again going back to the monolingual model of uh, understanding bilingualism. So, that is the fractional view, fractional view as in a bilingual is a sum of two monolinguals. Now, the holistic view is the opposite view. This view understands that bilinguals integrate the knowledge of their L1 and L2 basically both the languages or if he is a multilingual he uh, combines and integrates the, uh, the system and structure of all the languages and creates sort of a meta system. Okay, so the, this, there is an integrated system that a bilingual is um, uh, carries in his head so to say. 
right. So, and that that meta system is greater than each of the languages, like it is it is not a sum total of all the languages, but it is an overarching meta system, meta system that uh, that is greater than the sum total of each of the languages. This is something uh, uh, Grachon gives a good example in 2008, his uh, 2008 book, where he says that a bilingual can be compared with some with a high uh, high hurdler. High hurdler is an athletic um, track and field uh, uh, type. It's an event uh, where you combine both sprinting and high jumping. So a high hurdler is a different category of athlete altogether. He cannot be compared either with a sprinter or with a high jumper. That that comparison is completely out of the uh, uh, way because this is not supposed to be. A high hurdler is a category in itself. Similarly, one must look at uh, uh, bilingual as not in comparison with a monolingual in L1 versus a monolingual in L2. Rather, we should treat him like an uh, like a separate entity with a very different kind of uh, mental makeup and mental structure with respect to the languages. Right. So, the, just as no expert in track and field will ever compare the performance of high hurdler with a high jumper or a sprinter we should also not do the same with respect to bilinguals. This, this was one. So, there are many as I said there are many uh, levels of comparison, there are many levels of uh, understanding the nuances within the bilingual individual. That brings us to another type of organization with respect to bilinguals. Uh, this has been around for quite some time. So, organization of the two languages in the bilingual mind takes us to three different kinds of bilinguals. One is called the compound, another is subordinate, another is coordinate. While we talk about uh, the, this, this particular segment, I am trying to give you the uh, different uh, ways of looking at bilingual individuals by uh, from different theoretical perspectives. So, there is uh, it is not like they are all uh, separate watertight compartments, there is a lot of give and take. So, when we talk about bilingual division of bilinguals into co compound, coordinate and subordinate bilinguals, we are, this is not entirely separate from the fractional versus holistic, uh, which we will see when we uh, discuss the uh, experimental work. But these are just different ways of um, uh, dividing the group into categories from various perspective uh, for the purpose of research. So, because uh, not all bilinguals are same and how do we, what are the ways we can divide them? They have changed across time, across uh, depending on the point of departure, if you are looking at it psychologically, if you are looking at it linguistically, if you are looking at it in any other way, there are different kinds of names and uh, st standpoints given. But um, in, in ultimately, there are lots of give and take and there are lots of um, uh, interaction between them. So, compound bilingual is somebody who has one semantic system for two language codes. So, your conceptual storage is one, uh, but your words are different. So, that is there is a conceptual storage at a superordinate level and under uh, in, at a subordinate level you have the language uh, nodes, language codes, but the concepts remain the same. This is some somewhat similar to what the holistic view of bilingualism also says. So, this is what I mean by different ways of uh, dividing the bilingual individual into categories have a lot of uh, interaction among themselves. So, compound view of bilingual says that there is a compound mental storage, compound semantic storage that both the languages of the bilingual can access. So, the language codes are different, but the system might be same that is one right. The coordinate bilingual on the other hand has two semantic system for two language codes and uh, this refers to the one who learns the languages in different contexts. If you learn both the languages in the same context in uh, keeping everything same, it is it is easier for you to create one semantic uh, uh, storage. But if you have learned two languages in two different contexts, let us say uh, this happens in case of um, foreign language teaching for example. So, you have learnt your mother tongue or the first language uh, at home in the playground with your friends, peer group you know all that all of that. But you learn your foreign language let us say French in a classroom in a very different setup. So, it is not always possible that you will have an overlap between the concepts that is represented by your L, uh, L2 in this case. This is what the idea is. So, if you learn your two languages in two different contexts, chances are that you will have you will end up having two different semantic storage. 
and then subordinate bilingual is one whose weaker language is interpreted through the stronger language. So, you have your L2 is weaker and your L1 is stronger. So, you need to go via your L1 to interpret any given uh, linguistic signal that is another. Yet another way of dividing bilinguals into groups is taking the sequence of learning into consideration. Sequence of learning as in if you learn L2 after L1 that is when it, it is called the second language because this is the language that you will learn after the first language that is why it is second language. So, this is called successive bilingualism. Most of us are successive bilinguals because we learnt our L2 at home in our early childhood. Uh, L1 end at home in our early childhood, L2 we learned a little later when we uh, went to school or sometimes when you have you know gone out of your home and the people are uh, in the society people speak another language and you learn your L2. But sometimes children can learn both languages simultaneously. Simultaneous learning of two languages at the same time uh, it, it can happen in case of infant learners. So, L2 successive learning typically happens at a later age. When you are no more an infant, you have grown up a little bit, uh, at least you are even children can learn to the second language a little later. So, that, that does not make them infant learners. So, that is the overlap. So, uh, successive learners are more often than not adult learners, simultaneous learners are infant learners. What do you mean by infant learners who are simultaneous? For example, children growing up in a bilingual household. The both parents speak two different languages or sometimes the parents speak one language, but the caregiver speaks another language. So, from very early childhood, the infant is exposed to more than one language and he learns both of them simultaneously. That is the case when so simultaneous bilingualism happens. Yet another way of um, dividing bilinguals is that of calling them either balanced bilinguals or dominant. So, if your L1 and L2 proficiency are similar, then you are a balanced bilingual. So, most of your L2 proficiency is as good as your L1 proficiency. Theoretically, it is possible to be a balanced bilingual. On the other hand, a dominant bilingual is somebody for whom one language is dominant compared to the other. All of these are interconnected ideas. So, more often than not, a simultaneous bilingual will be a balanced bilingual. A successive bilingual will be a, a will have one language dominant than the other. So, after all of this, now let us move on to some recently um, developed ideas with respect to bilinguals. Uh, this, uh, this is the idea about bilingual bilinguals language mode. It was um, proposed by Francois Grachon and he says that language mode is a bilingual can have different language modes. So, the idea actually is not entirely his, uh, his own uh, new idea, entirely a uh, novel idea. The idea has been around in different names and in slightly different format. So, earlier there were uh, ideas like uh, language set and language context and so on, but he just in, he introduced a new idea with some modifications to this. So, what is language mode? Language mode basically refers to the activation, the state of activation of the languages of a bilingual. So, if a, as a bilingual how what is the state of activation of my uh, of all the languages that I speak right now. So, right now I am speaking in only English language. So, I am in a monolingual mode right. So, I am using because I am using only one language. So, activation this activation is a continuum as far as the uh, the scholar is concerned. He says that there this is not a you know a very separate kind of compartmentalization is not possible. A bilingual may go back and forth between a monolingual mode to a bilingual mode through certain intermediate modes. So, there is a base language, base language is the language which is activated at that given point of time. So, right now my base language is English. But so, my Hindi uh, language is not the activated one. So, this is in Hindi somewhere in the background as a result of which even though I am a bilingual I my base language is English and right now I am in a monolingual mode. So, this is what is this is the idea of language mode. So, what is language mode again? Language mode is the state of activation. Have you activated both the languages or you are activating only one language that is what he basically talks about. So, 
the base language chosen and the comparative activation level of the two languages there is a lot of interaction between them this is a dynamic thing so uh, base language and the mode can change without changing the other so for example uh, right now i am speaking only in uh, english so i am a hindi english bilingual let's say so i am speaking in hindi to a hindi monolingual in a and that given point of time i am in a monolingual hindi mode if I change my language to English altogether, right now I am speaking in English, so I am in a monolingual mode again. So the base language changes from English, Hindi to English, but the mode remains the same, right? this is possible. If the same person meets a Hindi English bilingual and speaks in Hindi, but at the same time there is code switching between Hindi and English, then it is uh, the other person is, will be uh, considered to be in a Hindi English bilingual mode. So, Hindi, if you are speaking only in Hindi, you are in a monolingual mode, you are speaking in only in English, you are monolingual mode. But if I am speaking to another fellow bilingual and I keep code mixing and code switching, then I am in a, a bilingual mode. This is the idea of uh, language mode. So, the stages of modes, the continuum starts uh, according to him, continuum starts at the monolingual mode where the bilingual is talking to or listening to monolingual cues. So, if I am talking to another person who knows Hindi and does not know English, I will not uh, switch between languages. So, I will or if I am just listening to only one language cue, I will not be able to, I will not be shifting. So, that is the monolingual end of the continuum. So, as other languages are not to be activated at all. Intermediate mode, what is intermediate mode? When the bilingual is um, exposed to a situation where the other person is also a bilingual, however, maybe either he is not proficient enough in the other language or he is not uh, uh, for whatever reason does not want to use the other language or mixed languages. In that kind of scenario, it is called intermediate mode. Intermediate mode as in your other language, the base language is activated, the other language is in, in a slightly semi-activated mode because it is not needed because even if the other person is bilingual, the person does not want to uh, mix. That is, that is intermediate mode and bilingual total bilingual mode will be when both are bilinguals and they are the entire atmosphere is bilingual and you are able to shift between the two languages that is what is called a bilingual mode. So, starting from the monolingual mode through intermediate mode to bilingual mode this is the continuum. So, this is how he, he shows it in his book in his 2008 book that is what so the the darkened box here this shows uh, activated the language that is uh, activated is the one that is um, base language and this language is not activated so this is almost white okay and then this language is slightly darker so this is now in intermediate mode and then this is when you have total bilingual mode because this two both of the languages are equally um, equally dark so the darkness of the boxes takes us to how which is the one that is activated. So, from least activated to the most activated while base language remains activated all the time. This is what the idea of language mode is. Now, what decides which mode you will be in? Already you have seen that there are various conditions, various contexts that, that makes uh, a person shift from monolingual uh, to intermediate to. So, this is how we can uh, categorize them. One is of course participants, participants in a conversation and their respective proficiency. So, if I am speaking to one person who knows only Hindi, obviously there is no chance of activating the second language. But if I am speaking to somebody who knows less English but does know a little bit of English, then chances of intermediate no mode is higher. And then uh, similarly, if I am speaking to a proficient bilingual, then bilingual mode. So, participants in a conversation scenario with their proficiency in that language is a very important factor in deciding the language mode of a bilingual. Similarly, the language mixing habits and attitudes, not all societies, are, not all conversation scenarios or all cultural um, uh, patterns allow mixing. So, if that is not the case, then bilingual mode will not be activated even if people there are people who are bilingual. So, let us say it may not be very um, uh, normal to code mix between Assamese 
and uh, Hindi, but Assamese and English code mixing may be more, uh, more welcome. So, in a, in a given context where it is not uh, welcome, even if I know all both the languages, it is still it will still not be activated. So, depending on the mixing habits and the <coughs> attitudes in the society. Remember, we, we talked a lot about attitude in the previous uh, part. So, attitude and, and habits of the society and the norms of the society uh, dis, uh, often uh, turns out to be a deciding factor. Similarly, usual mode of interaction, form and content of the message. Uh, let us say, you, I, I did mention this before also that uh, depending on the topic at hand, if we are in talking about uh, science and technology, chances of mixing English words are much higher as opposed to if you are talking about the weather, let us say something like that. So, the, depending on the topic of discussion, then kinship relation and so on situation, all of these can change. There have been some very interesting studies. Uh, I have just added some examples here to show how language uh, mode can be activated and does get activated by modulating the background scenario. So, this is one example from by Popular 1981. He was, this study is basically recording of a 35 year old member of a particular Puerto Rican neighborhood uh, uh, situated in New York. So, this is uh, in the English language setup and the community is Puerto Rican and she was recorded in four different uh, language situation. One is the formal scenario, formal scenario is where she responded to a questionnaire by uh, given to her by a bilingual member of her community. So, it was like a very formal thing, you give her a questionnaire and then she is uh, answering questions from there. Then there was an informal scenario where she had a conversation with the same person um, uh, by a bilingual uh, on, on topics of her own interest. So, it was not like a formatted questionnaire, uh, she, she could go you know it was a free flowing kind of a conversation or uh, whatever interests her like that. So, this becomes as a result an informal scenario. Then there was a vernacular scenario where she was doing errands and chatting with people in the neighborhood. She was just going around doing things and talking to other people in her own neighborhood. And then last was informal non-group. In this case, it was a uh, within the group. In the non-group informal scenario, she was conversing with Spanish English bilingual who is not a member of her community. Now, in this case, the language mode was not directly manipulated by it, but the social setting, the, the kind of neighborhood, the kind of participants in the conversation, all of that changed and that as a result had an impact on the language mode. And this is where participant was um, uh, considered to be at the bilingual end of the mode when she was uh, speaking in the informal and the vernacular setting because that was a free flowing thing. So, she was talking to the uh, same person from the a uh, person from his own, her own uh, community and there she was constantly code switching. So, code, when you code switch you are in a bilingual mode because if for you to be able to use words from both the languages, both languages should be active activated as a result of which we see a lot of um, code switching in those cases. But in the other two cases, the formal and the informal non-group member, then there was very less code switching showing that the mode was not bilingual. This was a very old rather old study 1981. Another study in 1998, they, they explicitly examined the impact of language mode on language choice and switching. So, this was done uh, with the Turkish German bilingual and this person was placed in three different uh, positions uh, by manipulating the person with whom he was talking. So, in condition 1 he was speaking to a member to members of German community, German speaking uh, family in Turkey who spoke very little Turkish. So, he had to speak mostly in German even though they are living in Turkey, but they speak German. So, this person had to use only German with them. As a result, he did not mix anything and there was no language mixing. In the condition 2, he spoke to a Turkish German bilingual just like himself whom he did not know very well. This was the situation was in Germany, he was talking to somebody in Germany and the language uh, base language was also same in this context which is German and mixed language utterances also were not too much, not too many. Condition 3 was the same person talked to a good friend who is also a bilingual in Turkey. 
the base language here was Turkish but it was there was a lot of mixing which means the condition uh, 3 here is similar to the vernacular condition and the informal condition in the previous experiment where you are relaxed and you know that mixing is allowed you are a good friend of the person and thereby you are in a bilingual mode. So, even if you are talking to a bilingual that does not necessarily mean that bilingual mode will be activated. So, that is what both of these studies show that it is not only when you talk to a monolingual but also when you talk to a bilingual but mixing is not expected then you can be still in a monolingual mode. So, code switching basically is a good indicator of that. Similarly, there was yet another study this was a laboratory based study where language mode of French English bilinguals were manipulated. The task was here they used a storytelling task. So, the task was to tell a story to three different imaginary people. Uh, for two, two different imaginary persons. So, person A uh, he was uh, referred to as a French person and uh, he was he had just arrived in the US to do a postdoc. The person is not there ok. So, this, he, this is an imaginary person he is told that ok now you narrate this story to this person. And this uh, imaginary postdoc uh, could read and write English quite well but had difficulty speaking it his home language was French. Now, this was the whole or uh, this entire narrative was built to tell him that to put him in the monolingual mode. Person B was described as a French who lived in US for 7 years and works for the French uh, company. His children go to bilingual school. He taught French and organized French cultural events. He spoke only French at home although he was a fluent bilingual. This entire long narrative is given just to put the person in a proper set of mind. So, basically you are explicitly putting the uh, subject the, the person who is under study in a in one of the three modes. So, in the first case uh, it is uh, a monolingual mode in the second case the person knows uh, both the languages he is also a bilingual, but he does not use it. So, he prefers to use French hence this creates an intermediate mode and then person C was described as a traditional immigrant and he lived in US for 7 years and he had French and American friends and spoke both languages. Now, this is both languages at home means that you are that person is constantly switching between languages. So, this also puts the subject in this case in a bilingual uh, mode. So, the results as expected depending on the situation given the code switching pattern also changed. So, all these studies basically show that there is this idea of language mode actually holds a person even if he is bilingual can be in a monolingual mode given various kinds of conducive conditions participants their language preference the attitude to bilingualism attitude towards language mixing and so on. These experiments were all called production experiment because the subject was expected to speak to produce speech. Now, we also have some perception studies though the uh, number of such studies are less. So, there was the study in 1987 on uh, French English bilinguals they were asked to do a lexical decision task on two types of words. One group of words were pure words that list was um, coming from only one language and the mixed list of course, had uh, words from two languages. The results showed that there was a difference of 36 milliseconds which was considered to be significant. So, uh, language mode does have an impact on your comprehension of words as well. Acquisition is another area language acquisition as in language learning now that is another area that also has pointed towards existence of language mode. Typically these studies deal with uh, children who have uh, parents who speak to different languages or they have they prefer different language modes and so on. So, one particular study here that uh, that recorded a Norwegian English bilingual child named Siri uh, and uh, her interaction with her father and her mother is what they, the, they recorded. So, the father's language preferences were a lot more open in the sense that he did not mind language mixing at all and whenever Siri mixed between Norwegian and English he responded similarly. So, the language uh, of interaction between Siri and her father was almost of the time bilingual mode. However, the mother pretended as if she does not understand mixed language. So, Siri was motivated to use only one language pure form pure language to 
uh, talk to her mother. So, mixed she did not uh, prefer mixing. As a result of this strategy, there was the difference in result. So, Siri would mix a lot of content word uh, while talking to her father, but not with her mother. So, parental discourse this takes us to a very all different uh, entirely different plane altogether, where we see that parental discourse patterns uh, or strategies have also uh, an effect of creating language mode in children. So, depending on whether you are uh, whether it is encouraged or not, Siri showed different um, results with respect to her communication with both the persons, both her parents. Similarly, from the uh, domain of pathology, there were studies again uh, in 1998 by uh, Krajan that they manipulated language mode in a study that examined spoken language production in eight French German aphasic bilinguals. Aphasia is a language disorder where you have a difficulty either in speaking or in understanding or both uh, or different degrees of um, disability in speaking and understanding and so on. So, aphasia basically is a language uh, disorder. They uh, had French in German bilingual aphasics and they had give, been given various tasks. So, uh, many of these tasks, some of these are here, place one of the several cards in a specified place on the board, these are basically games. So, put this card on that, that part of the board and so on. Sometimes they have to describe a postcard in a well enough manner so that the other person finds the equivalent the, the, uh, the respective card. And then there was um, a taking part in a topic constraint discussion. So, given a topic you do not you cannot go outside of the topic and you have to discuss and so on. There were many such um, uh, topics, they, they were also allowed to talk freely on a topic and so on. Now, manipulation while all of these things were going on, how do you manipulate the language mode? It was done through the interlocutor, interlocutor as in the person with whom they were talking. The entire um, um, task was carried out by an examiner, so that was the interlocutor with whom they had to talk. So, that interlocutor changed, there were two interlocutors, one a French speaker who did not know German and the other was a French and German bilingual. The result showed that 6 out of the 8 aphasics could still control their language output depending on the interlocutor. So, if they, if they are talking to even an aphasic, the why this study is interesting is that in normal circumstances um, all of us modulate our language mode. We are when we are talking to a monolingual, we consciously go into a monolingual mode, uh, with a bilingual we automatically go to a bilingual mode that is that is already seen. But even in case of uh, language impairment, even in case of language disorders, we uh, this study finds out that depending on the interlocutors, they change their language mode. So, if it is a bilingual language, a bilingual interlocutor, they on, went to the bilingual mode, if it is a single with a monolingual uh, interlocutor, they switched to monolingual mode, right. So, this is a very interesting finding because of uh, this kind of findings from both normal as well as language disorder studies. So, language mode can be defined as the state of activation as we have seen. So, uh, we can summarize this by saying by quoting him uh, Rajan and Lee by language mode can be defined as a state of activation of the bilingual two languages, right. So, this is how they explain this. Again, the darkened uh, box is the one that is activated the less darkened ones, uh, one is the one that is less activated. And if you want the should the other language be brought in, if it is no, then this remains uh, uh, less activated, the L language B remains less activated, which is in uh, shown as a lighter color. But if the question is yes, that the second language should also be brought in, in that case, this is this gets a little darker, meaning the second language is getting activated. Okay, so, this is how the language um, activation in different scenarios uh, work. Yet another interesting idea in terms of uh, individual bilingualism is the idea of bicultural bilingualism. This is uh, quite interesting uh, as we will see. So, now what is culture? Culture, uh, we are not talking about highbrow culture here, we are talking about culture as a, the entire social, the, the set of beliefs and values and you know um, traditions etc. so on and so forth that one is part of. So, as uh, let us say as a Bengali, 
Now, uh, when we say Bengali culture, what does it incorporate? It, inc it incorporates many things from food to dress to behavior pattern to belief systems to traditional um, way of celebrating things, uh, various things in life and so on. So, all together this is what creates a life, uh, creates a culture. So, Bengalis have a culture, there is an Assamese culture, there is Tamil culture and so on. And also we have an overall thing called Indian culture. So, that is the idea of culture in this course. We are not going into the finer aspect of culture here. So, while you are these are called majority cultures, so important uh, main cultures, bigger, bigger aspects of cultures. While you are being a, while you are a part of let us say Bengali or Assamese culture simultaneously all of us are also part of smaller groups, smaller levels of culture, smaller cultural aspects in the society. So, they are also called minor cultures as in part of a network let us say a sporting group or a, you know different kinds of hobby group, occupation dependent group. So, as a teacher I am uh, though I am part of the larger um, uh, let us say language uh, one language two communities, but at the same time within that language community I am also part of a minor culture of teachers something like that. So, these are called minor cultures and major cultures. Then what, what makes you a bicultural? Does it mean that I am a bicultural because I am part of a larger Assamese culture at the same time as a teacher community? Not really. What uh, the definition of biculturalism is that a person who takes part in two major or distinct cultures is a considered a bicultural person. So, as a result they will adapt. So, if you are part of um, two different cultures and you have uh, no access to and you can participate in two different cultures, the person can also adapt in some parts their uh, attitude, values and behaviors etc. to the to these distinct and mutually exclusive cultures. Okay. So, and also another yet another important aspect of bicultural is that they combine and blend aspects of these two different cultures. So, we will see each of them separately. So, uh, one example that they give is young Chinese people in Great Britain uh, taking part in the life of their own Chinese community as well as that of the majority British community. Any immigrant community in any, any culture for that matter will qualify to be a bicultural because uh, while they maintain their bilingual uh, Chinese language and culture they also participate in the larger British culture. So, they are they have easy access to both as a result of which we can say that they can take part in both the cultures. So, Bengalis living in Assam or Telugu's living in uh, Tamil Nadu, you, you name it. So, this, this is called a bicultural person and bicultural person takes part in both the cultures while maintaining their own distinctiveness. So, a Bengali living in Assam does not become a less Bengali, then he may he or she maintains the Bengali culture simultaneously also takes part in the Assamese culture. Now, as a result of this, it is human to combine to create a meta system. So, you adapt to certain you, you change yourself, you modulate your behavior given the scenario. So, biculturals at least to some uh, to some degree they can adapt their attitude, behavior, language uh, of the different to the different cultures when they participate in them. This is a dynamic system where they choose bilinguals, uh, biculturals choose different aspects of life based on the situation they are in. So, a Bengali behaves differently in a Bengali gathering versus a Bengali behaving in an Assamese gathering or for that matter uh, there are lots of uh, uh, Kannadas, uh, there are lots of Tamils in Bangalore. So, those Tamil Tamilians uh, when they are in a Kannadiga, Kannadiga gathering they will behave slightly differently, uh, you know more uh, in tune with the Kannadiga gathering versus when they are in the Tamil gathering they will behave more in tune in the Tamil gathering. So, that is called adapting. Now, this of course, this is not possible if you do not know the cultures well enough. Until and unless you know uh, the, the subtle nuances, the nitty gritty of one culture, you will not be able to adapt. So, being a bicultural automatically um, entails that one has a very good grip on the not only uh, the culture of his own, but also the other culture that he is taking part in. And then the idea of combining and blending. This, uh, this is understood as that uh, bilinguals and uh, biculturals tend to blend different aspects from given uh, of the different cultures that um, and give it a very different kind of a, a blended combined sort of a characteristic. So, body language of bicultural is 
one aspect of such blend. So, basically this is also a very common human reaction to uh, a number of stimuli. So, when we, 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 we tend to combine them and create a, a meta sort of an attitude that has aspects from all of these inputs that we have been receiving. Right? So, now he proposes that a bicultural always carries the blended aspects with her and hence can never be a 100 percent A or B because this is somewhat like a bilingual. So, if you are a bilingual you uh, create a, the holistic view says that you create a meta understanding of language meta you create a meta being uh, which is superimposed. Similarly, a bicultural. So, you can neither 100 percent even if you are a Tamil uh, living in uh, you know in a Tamil set uh, setup in a Tamil scenario in Tamil uh, society, but you still also have your Kannadiga uh, knowledge system in embedded in you then you are never 100 percent this or 100 percent that this is another uh, aspect of what he says. Now, uh, many bilinguals are biculturals. What does that mean that if you speak two languages and if you have uh, access now this depends on how you learnt your second language. If you have learnt your second language in a social way in a in a in a way where you have access to the socio-cultural norms of that society that speaks your second language chances are very high you will become a bicultural bilingual alright. So, uh, often as a result it is quite common for bilinguals to be bicultural. However, that does not mean all bilinguals will be bi bicultural that is not always the case. So, for example, Hindi English bilinguals are not biculturals. Why? Because we learn English in the Hindi scenario only. We do not uh, accept those who go to US uh, to learn English language, then you have access to that culture. But otherwise, we are living in, a, in one culture, but we are simply learning the English language without being part of the English culture. Hence, Hindi English bilinguals are not bicultural bilinguals. However, Boro Assamese uh, bilinguals can be understood as bicultural bilinguals because they live both within the Bodo culture as well as within the Assamese culture. There is a lot of um, interaction between the communities and hence the person can participate. So, remember the three aspects of being a bicultural you have to you can take part, you can adapt and you can blend these things qualify an Arboro Assamese as a bicultural bilingual, but not a Hindi English bilingual. Immigrants are often biling bicultural bilingual because they have migrated into a host culture and language. So, which they have to uh, understand adopt and you know uh, get used to uh, while they also maintain their own language. So, typically immigrants are typically there are also exceptions, but more often than not immigrants are a bicultural bilingual. So, a lot of people in countries that are essentially bilingual, bicultural or bilingual are also bicultural. Many this is true for Indians, uh, even if there is no migration here and the people among ourselves we are we have different languages and different cultures, but many of us are also bicultural. So, when we learn um, uh, as I am giving the example of Assamese Boro, Assamese uh, Bengali, similarly many other such communities. So, there is a lot of participation in each other's language and culture, there is a lot of uh, adaptation as well you know, as a result of this and also naturally blending. So, by it is quite common to find bicultural bilinguals in societies that are essentially by bi or multilingual which is not the case in many uh, monolingual countries or uh, monolingual so monocultural societies. So, this is about um, biculturalism and what uh, who are typically uh, found to be bicultural. Now, differences also exist between biculturalism and bilingualism. He proposes that bicultural uh, person can never deactivate the culture currently in you not in use. Even if I am uh, let us say I, I am a Kannadiga and I am living in I living in uh, live in Madras. Uh, so, I, I and I am entirely immersed in the Tamil culture that does not mean I can deactivate my Kannadiga cultural uh, aspects that is not possible. So, this is where a crucial difference between biculturalism and bilingualism. So, even though bilingualism and biculturalism sometimes go hand in hand there are crucial differences as well. A bilingual however, can deactivate his second language how by switching on the monolingual mode, but bicultural can never um, deactivate his 
other other culture. So, this is a very crucial difference uh, and this we will see later on in the course now when we talk about when we discuss experimental work taking all of these variables into account. So, basically how does one uh, become a bicultural? This is uh, bicultural by being in constant touch from your childhood if you have uh, access to a larger society outside of your home which is distinct. So, home culture is different from outside the culture and so on. Migration and um, also sometimes, so these the first three points are uh, we have some something that we have already discussed, but the last point is also very interesting because this can also happen when the third or fourth generation of immigrants children suddenly rediscover. So, sometimes when migrant uh, populations after a few generations they, they stop speaking their language, they stop following their culture. But if the scenario, if the host culture has become more accepting of the difference, then often it happens that the youngsters want to go back to their own culture and own language and they rediscover and hence reactivate their cultures that also is possible. So, biculturalism can happen because of all of these various factors. So, we have seen by uh, language mode, language uh, by cultural bilingualism and various other aspects how by uh, on the basis of which bilinguals can be differentiated. All of these have been utilized in bilingualism research. Dominance is also another factor whether your uh, L2 is dominant or your L1 is dominant um, uh, depending on the uh, scenario that uh, you have been brought up in or your language use pattern and so on. So, these are roughly the variables there will be many more which we will discuss as we go along, but uh, this sets the tone of the course and gives you a basic uh, understanding of what to expect in the later modules. So, we complete module 1 here, thank you.